One of the toughest challenges in WWE 2K is winning in my GM on all of the hardest difficulty settings with an entire roster of local talent, also known as jobbers. No superstars and definitely no legends are allowed. I decided to throw myself in at the deep end and see if I could come out victorious against not one, not two, but three hard AI opponents on my first attempt. On top of this, we'd be operating with the smallest budget and with shakeups turned off. Our goal? Earn more fans than all of our rivals. Welcome to Jobbers Only. The first decisions I had to make was who was going to be my general manager and what brand would my team of jobbers be representing. We'd then have to go through the draft process and sit in envy as my rivals drafted some of the biggest superstars in WWE. Choosing my GM and brand was more a process of elimination than it was about picking who I'd like to be. It's unlikely that money would ever be an issue for me in this challenge, as I wouldn't be drafting lots of expensive superstars and local talent is so cheap. This ruled out any GM and brand that would give me financial benefits or boosts related to superstars. In the end, I settled on hiring Tyler Breeze as my GM because his ability to increase 20 stamina across the entire roster could be crucial. At this stage, I have no idea what the stamina is going to be like on the jobbers that I hire, and I'm going to have to hire them regardless due to a lack of options, so having this power card could be crucial early on, and if I don't need it early on, then I could still put it to good use later in the season. For the brand, I decided to go with NXT. Their fighting champion power card would allow me to increase the match ratings on all title fights in one week of the season, and that could help me put on at least one good show. Whilst I knew this would be an extremely difficult challenge, I had a few tricky strategies up my sleeve, and that started with the draft. The draft is an unskippable process, and only superstars are available. You must draft at least 9 superstars too. If you're wondering how I can complete the jobbers only challenge when this is a fixed rule of the game, it's pretty simple. I just can't use any of the superstars in a match card or in a promo, and I must commit to releasing them all from their contracts as soon as possible. I'd also only draft the minimum number required. My first clever trick was to focus on drafting the 9 most popular superstars that I could get my hands on, just so my rivals couldn't get them, at least at the start, before I would go on to release them one by one as the weeks progress. This is another fixed rule in the game by the way, it only lets me release one superstar per week, so that is what I would be doing. I ended up drafting Roman Reigns, Bianca Belair, and a range of other highly popular superstars, though my rivals got plenty of popular picks too, because I put it in a snake draft format to be as fair and as difficult as possible. As for the other tricks that I had in mind for the season, I decided that I would try to buy every power card I could to enhance my shows or help my roster recover, I would complete every commissioner goal or season goal that I could for additional free power cards, and I'd upgrade everything as soon as I could and always max out all of my logistics. If I couldn't invest my money into my roster, I'd at least have to put it into putting on a good show. It was now finally the time to check the free agent pool and see which local talent would try to become legends for my brand NXT. I'd basically have to ignore stamina and popularity and just focus on creating a roster of good matchups, but even that would turn out to be a struggle. In the women's division, I signed Cora Cut and Trixie Gambit to be a starting rivalry, and Penelope Perfect and Ali Brawler to be another. In the men's division, I ended up signing the face talent of Heath Manhattan, Matador, Triton, and Broderick. As for heels, I welcomed Tim Burr, Eddie Pop, Diamond Lobby legend Kyle Slickman, and the least popular talent on my roster, with just 25 popularity and costing only $28,000 to sign on a permanent contract, Jerry Hattrick. When I signed Jerry Hattrick, I sat down with him, and he told me that despite his old age, he dreamed of one day becoming the headline act at WrestleMania. And you know what I said to him? I believe in you, Jerry, more than you could ever know. I think you could one day become a triple title holder and have the chance to go down in history by retaining all three belts in the WrestleMania main event. It seemed like a pipe dream, but we were just 25 weeks away from trying to make that a reality. With my roster locked in, it was finally the time to put on my first show. Like all good MyGM players, I put on as many belts on the line as I could in week one. We started with Eddie Pop vs Triton for the world title. Next up, a men's tag team championship match between Tim Burr and Kyle Slickman against Heath Manhattan and Broderick. Then, controversially not a title match for the vacant men's title, Jerry Hattrick against Matador. I promised Jerry that if he could somehow craft a rivalry in this dreadful fighter versus fighter matchup, because I had no other choice, I would reward him with his first title shot next week. And in the main event, we had Ali Brawler and Trixie Gambit going up against our most popular local talent Cora Cut, alongside Penelope Perfect, two opponents that would go on to become long-term rivalries. 
We could only put on one promo this week, it was a charity promotion, and quite amusingly, something I didn't realise at the time, it was from a jobber called Sensational Starla, who I'd somehow managed to sign on just a one week contract. As far as the week's results were concerned, the less said the better. The show went about as badly as I could have predicted, with a 2 star opening match going on to be the best of the entire show, followed by a 1.5 star, and then a 1 star midcard match from Jerry Hattrick vs Matador, and another 1.5 star match in the main event. We'd finished week 1 in last place by 15,000 fans, and we were 24,000 fans behind first. Somehow I suspected things would only get worse from here. But there was some good news. Despite the catastrophic one star performance, Jerry Hattrick managed to develop a level 1 rivalry with Matador. As promised, he'd now get a shot at the vacant men's title belt in week 2. As the second week rolled around, new local talent was available to be signed. I picked up Beth Spartan and Danielle Wallace, a cruiser and a giant that would pair up nicely against each other. I had a superstar training card too, so I applied it to Beth Spartan to give us one of our first boosts to the roster. She'd be disappearing for two weeks whilst this happened though, and I also signed Captain Grog and Chuck McWagon. These guys weren't signed to be direct rivals. Instead, they were signed to fix the broken fighter versus fighter rivalry between Jerry Hattrick and Matador, a rivalry that would be short-lived, as I made use of 2K23's new submission match type to guarantee an end to their feud in week 2. I'd get a much needed 1000 additional fans from this match type, and Jerry would get his shot at the men's championship on the opener of the card. I managed to fill out the promo slots for the first time this week with three separate callouts, two of which were successful in generating rivalries. Jerry went over in the opener and became the men's champion in one of the greatest and most epic head to head contest. No, it was a two star match, which honestly is better than I thought it would be. We continued to meet the drama curve with a good booking, and we even had a 2.5 star main event, a tables match between Eddie Pop and Triton with the world title on the line. It shows how hard this challenge is when I was actually pretty excited to get a 2.5 star match. Triton was not happy about losing his belt and immediately demanded a rematch with Eddie Pop. As we'd now fallen to 17,000 fans behind third place and 37,000 fans behind first, it was an easy decision to grant Triton's request as they'd just delivered the best match that we've ever seen in the short history of our brand. In week 3, my commissioner goal was to use my least popular wrestler in a match. Oh yeah, good one Triple H. Rub it in why don't ya? This week, Trixie Gambit would get her first shot at winning the women's belt against Penelope Perfect, a rivalry that would go on to have many unexpected twists and turns throughout this challenge that you'll be genuinely shocked to see. But to start it all off, Trixie picked up the win and became NXT's first female jobber champion in a 2.5 star match that the game describes as okay. Okay? A 2.5 star match? That's incredible for us! Captain Grog made his debut for the brand against Matador in a 1.5 star midcard, Tim Burr teamed up with Kyle Slickman for a second time against Heath Manhattan and Broderick in another 1.5 star midcard match, and Triton got his rematch against Eddie Pop in the main event, but lost again in our first 3 star match. It was another good booking, it was our first 3 star main event, and yet we still lost fans compared to our rivals. We were now in last place by 30,000 fans, and we were 56,000 fans off top spot. I think it's important to look at the positives wherever we can. The good thing about performing so badly is at least I knew that none of my rivals would target me with their power cards. After all, we're just a team of lowly local talent, in last place by a country mile. And yes I am saying this because, for some reason that I still don't understand, going into week 4, Mick Foley decided to use his one and only Cactus Jack power card for the season on us, meaning we'd get two guaranteed long term injuries on our card this week, and not just any week, but the week before our first premium line event that could make or break our season! <sighs> Needless to say, we just made ourselves a rivalry with Mick Foley and Raw, and if I couldn't win this season, then I'd at least have to try to take him down. I'm not gonna lie, Mick's card totally derailed my thought process. I made what I thought was the best decision at the time, and I signed a whole load of new local talent, basically for a one week show. They'd all be potential fall guys. I was going to throw the week because I couldn't risk any of my biggest stars, and I use that in the lightest possible sense of the word, getting injured. I think this might have been a big mistake, but I'll explain why later on. Because it was a one week plan with repercussions that probably couldn't affect me too much, I signed 8 new jobbers and threw them all into singles matches with big stipulations. Stacked McSlacks went up against Argus the Great in a 2.5 star false count anywhere match. Bobby Marquis went up against Jackson Smooth in a tables match, but it was only one star. Adrian Williams went up against Silence in an extreme rules match, but it was another lowly 1.5 star midcard. 
and the main event was a total disappointment. Cash suplex against Dante Roberts in a 1.5 star rated Iron Man match. Only one man from my existing roster was brave enough to make an appearance on the card and risk a potential injury. Jerry f***ing Hattrick. He stepped into the ring to call out Chuck McWagon in a brave move that managed to propel their rivalry to level 3 after a couple of previous successful callouts from the pair. The show received a good booking rating, but it was a disaster overall. No variety, low scores, and we were now 94,000 fans behind first. But that wasn't the most important thing for this week. Who got injured as a result of Mick Foley's power card? Would Jerry regret taking the stage, albeit with a microphone? The injury reports came back. Dante Roberts would be out for three weeks, and Jackson Smooth would be out for at least five weeks. I couldn't help but feel a lot of guilt for Jackson Smooth here. I knew that a lot of these new recruits would rarely or never appear on our shows again after this week. I knew that someone would get hurt, and he's the guy that took the full force of it. Can I get some respect on Jackson Smooth's name in the comments, please? After Jerry Hattrick's brave decision to show up in week 4, I used a to the moon power card on him to guarantee a plus 15 popularity boost after his next match. He was already the men's title holder, and he seemed to possess all the ingredients we were looking for to become the face of our brand. Going into our first premium live event, I decided to go big on the match types again, with the plan to use Tyler Breeze's plus 20 stamina recovery card after the event. Mick Foley had really messed up my plans with his power card. I hate you, Mick. I threw Trixie Gambit and Ali Brawler into a steel cage match against Cora Cut and Penelope Perfect with the female tag team championship on the line. Jerry Hattrick wouldn't make the main event yet, but he featured in the middle of our PLE's midcard in another submission match with the men's title on the line. Beth Spartan and Danielle Wallace, whose rivalry had been building via callouts whilst Beth was off at Superstar Training Camp, became our main event, a hell in a cell, due to their high stamina counts. The remaining mid-card matches were triple threats and fatal four ways to give us plenty of show variety. The results from our first show came in and I was feeling confident for the first time this season. The female tag team title match delivered our first five star performance. Jerry, in the middle of the pack, defended his men's title in a 3.5 star thriller, by far his best performance for NXT. And the main event, Beth Spartan vs Danielle Wallace, delivered a 4.5 star classic. We won't say too much about the other matches, let's just focus on the good stuff. We got our first amazing booking of the season and gained 137,000 fans this week, which, for the first time, wasn't the worst performance of all of the brands. In fact, it was the second biggest increase of the week. We were still in last place by quite a long way, but this week gave me hope that we might, might, have a glimmer of hope in this challenge. After the PLE, a social media influencer named Sammy Vortex wanted to join us. I already had a huge roster of local talent after Mick Foley's antics in week 4, but the allure of new fans and fast-growing popularity suckered me into saying yes. It would take a bit of time for Sammy to get a shot, but with a 10-week initial contract, I had plenty of time to play with. I applied Tyler's quick recovery card as planned and continued on my mission to somehow turn this challenge around. Eddie Pop and Triton continued to deliver banger matches for me in a four-star title match to open week 6's show. Ali and Cora went head-to-head, -head. a couple of new tag teams faced off in Captain Grog and Silenced against Matador and Adrian Williams, and Kyle Slickman appeared in a main event for the first time in a 3.5-star rated steel cage match against Chuck McWagon. And then something crazy happened. The results came in, and we were no longer in last place. After our performance at the PLE, Followed by a half-decent showing in week 6, we overtook Xavier Woods and NXT 2.0. NXT 2.0? More like NXT 2... Oh, no, you're not as good as the regular NXT. Am I right? <laughs> Despite this small success, we were now 70,000 fans behind our fierce rival Mick Foley, and even more behind Kurt Angle's SmackDown. Nothing particularly exciting happened in week 7, other than Jerry Hattrick getting his first main event appearance in an Iron Man match against Broderick with the men's title on the line again. And Jerry won it, in a 4.5 star classic. Jerry is undefeated for the season, and more importantly, undefeated in title matches. And he's now putting in performances that are making the fans start to love him too. In week 8, I'm sorry to say it, we put on an absolute stinker. Despite utilising tables matches and extreme rules matches, we saw three two-star matches, followed by a 2.5-star main event, and we were now back in last place again. The saving grace was that Matador and Captain Grog had developed our first ever level 4 rivalry. 
In week nine, Kyle Slickman came to me and said he was sick of losing against Broderick, so I promised to put him in a match against Chuck McWagon instead. I didn't have any fixed match cards, so we'd have to hope that Kyle could finally win a match this season, and we managed to put on a bit of a better show this time around. Beth Spartan and Danielle Wallace delivered a 3.5 star opener and progressed their own rivalry to level 4 as well. Kyle Slickman did not manage to win his match against Chuck McWagon, and it was a disappointing 1.5 star performance to boot. My poor run of male tag team performances continued, with Tim Burr and Captain Grog losing to Heath Manhattan and Broderick in another 1.5 star match that yet again failed to develop a male tag team rivalry. I'd have to put on my thinking cap to try and fix this. But in the main event, Trixie Gambit managed to deliver the goods and retain her female championship belt against Penelope Perfect in a 3.5 star clash. Despite a little bit of a better showing this week, we'd slipped to 23,000 fans behind third place. But I had some confidence going into week 10, our second premium live event of the year, after building up some exciting rivalries. Not only had I built some rivalries, but I wanted to start to prove to myself, if to no one else, that I could complete this challenge. So I used NXT's Fighting Champion card to give myself a boost on all title matches taking place this week in the hope that it could propel me back up the leaderboard. I would stop at nothing to ensure this would be a great week. Triton went up against Eddie Pop in a level 3 rivalry submission match with the world title on the line again. This would be an end to their rivalry, but who would come out as the champion? Heath and Broderick would be going up against Kyle Slickman and Tim Burr with the men's tag team belt up for grabs. Captain Grog and Matador were in the middle of the card in the only non-title match, but it was a level 4 rivalry in a steel cage, which was bound to be good. Jerry Hattrick, despite being on rivalry cooldown with Chuck McWagon, would square up against him again obviously with the men's title on the line due to our power card boost. And in our first level 4 tag team rivalry, Trixie Gambit would team up with Ali Brawler to take on her long-term rivalry Penelope Perfect and teammate Cora Cut. Could Trixie Gambit become our first holder of two different belts in the main event? In the opener, Eddie Pop managed to end his rivalry with Triton as the world champion in a 4.5 star classic. Our men's tag team title match delivered a 4 star performance, with Kyle Slickman losing yet again and no rivalry being developed. Captain Grog against Matador delivered a 4 star, as did the rivalry on cooldown between Jerry Hattrick and Chuck McWagon. And was there any doubt that Jerry Hattrick would retain the belt yet again? And the main event certainly delivered in a 5 star legendary matchup to end the tag team rivalry between the two women's teams but it certainly wouldn't end the rivalry that continued to brew between Trixie Gambit and Penelope Perfect. Trixie and Ali did not manage to win the tag team belt, and Trixie despised the fact that her rival Penelope had taken the opportunity to become a two belt champion away from her. The results were in, and we managed to gain 146,000 fans, the second most fans gained again this week, and we jumped back into third place. Unfortunately, Kurt Angle's SmackDown, who were already leading, were the biggest gainers of the week, and they moved to around 175,000 fans ahead of us. If I was going to win this challenge, I'd need a bit of luck, and I'd need to start thinking about how I could turn things around, starting with an issue that had plagued my brand since the start. Every men's tag team match sucks. I looked at my roster, and I had an epiphany. Like a message from God himself. Kyle Slickman is a Diamond Lobby legend, but he can't stop losing, and male tag team matches can't seem to deliver a good match. But who can't stop winning? And who is delivering good matches? And who also happens to be a heel, and a fighter, and old as f Jerry Hattrick. Ladies and gentlemen, a new tag team is born. Sammy Vortex, the social media influencer that we signed, made her first appearance in Week 11's show. Kyle Slickman, with Jerry by his side, finally managed to pick up a win. Trixie Gambit squared up against Penelope Perfect and exacted a small amount of revenge from the previous week with a win, but after an unbelievable week 10, week 11 was not good overall. Our finale was a total flop, and it was our first show of the season that did not receive at least a good booking rating. We gained just 37,000 fans this week, which was still the same as Raw. Ha! Screw you, Mick! Week 12 looked like it was going by with nothing much to write home about. Other than Kyle Slickman finally winning a singles match after his morale boosting tag team victory the week before, and a couple of our signings from the devastating injury week made a main event appearance for the first time. Stacked McSlacks went up against Argus the Great in a Hell in a Cell. And then Mick Foley came back and applied a double cost card to us. We've not done anything to Mick, and yet he continues to attack us. 
It was with this that I realised I was going to have to start playing dirty if I was going to somehow snatch a victory here. In week 11, thanks to rotating my roster a little bit and getting some rest here and there, I managed to put on quite a big show. Cora Cut and Ali Brawler went head to head in a Falls Count Anywhere match. Dante Roberts and Eddie Pop teamed up against Triton and Cash Suplex in a tables match. Kyle faced off against Chuck again, and Trixie Gambit put her title on the line again against her rival Penelope Perfect in a main event tables match. But it was Penelope who would come out on top, becoming the first jobber to hold two belts simultaneously at NXT in a four-star match. We gained the most fans this week, and despite the gap to first place still being 131,000 fans, I was starting to believe that this could actually be possible. When week 14 rolled around, I was shocked by a new feature of the game that could have been the stroke of luck we needed to make a victory possible here, but it would be an incredibly difficult decision to make. After becoming our first two belt champion, a movie studio offered us just over $1 million if we would let Penelope Perfect record a movie with them. Trixie Gambit would not be happy if I approved this because she'd have to wait at least five weeks for a chance to regain her title as Penelope would be off recording for four. I hoped that we were talking about a Dwayne The Rock Johnson type of movie rather than the type of movie that some WWE stars seem to find themselves in and I decided to accept. We could put that money to such good use by being able to buy a lot of power cards and that payoff was just too strong to turn down. Trixie immediately came to me to demand a rematch for the title within two weeks but obviously I had to decline. That rematch was literally impossible to make, and she got mad. With Mick Foley continuing to play dirty against me, I realized it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I bought and applied two cards, the Vito Superstar and Vito Random Star to SmackDown. Yes, this isn't Raw or Mick Foley, but I'm focusing on winning this challenge now. If I could win, it would mean that I'd beat Mick Foley anyway, so I had to make the sensible decision to target SmackDown as they were in the lead two of their stars would now be blocked from performing at next week's PLE. Other than the movie and the playing dirty, there was nothing special about week 14's card at all. It delivered an unspectacular 3.5 star, 2 star, 2 star and 2.5 star good booking. Then it said we were in first place and I still don't really know why. We had two Hall of Fame trophies and SmackDown only had one. SmackDown were 143,000 fans ahead of us, but I guess the game could have been prioritizing season trophies only they couldn't be, because Mick Foley also had two Hall of Fame trophies, and he's in third place with more fans than me. I didn't know if this was a bug or if there's some kind of budget calculation factored in along with trophies and fans, but I made the decision for the challenge that I would only be basing any loss or victory on the total number of fans. As far as I was concerned, there was still a long way to go, and I was still a long way behind. And if you know why I was apparently in first place here, or if you know this is a bug, please do let me know in the comments. Going into our third premium live event, week 15, Kurt retaliated against me by trying to play dirty with a double cost promo card. Don't you know we've got $1.2 million in the bank? I don't care about your stupid double cost card, Kurt, but I do care that you've tried to attack me, even if it was retaliation. I was even more motivated to beat him now, and we managed to put on an epic show. Stacked McSlacks faced off against Angus the Great in a level 4 Falls Count Anywhere, and it was rated as a 5 star legendary match. Dante Roberts and Eddie Pop finished their tag team rivalry against Triton and Cash Suplex, and I even had Tyler Breeze do a GM interference with a coast-to-coast -coast card applied in a 3.5 star great match. Jerry Hattrick put his title on the line in a last man standing against Broderick, and it was a 5 star legendary match, and needless to say, Jerry came out victorious. Chuck and Kyle faced off in a normal level 2 rivalry match, just me trying to manage stamina and balance rivalries, but it was a disappointing 2 star. In the main event, Danielle against Beth in a level 4 rivalry ended in another legendary 5 star match. It would be tough for other brands to compete with that kind of show. And tough it was indeed, as we gained 41,000 fans more than the next best brand. With 10 weeks to go in the weirdly messed up leaderboard, our rival Mick Foley had now taken the lead, but with just 13,200 fans behind him. Kurt Angle, in 3rd place on the leaderboard for some reason, is leading in fans, and we're still 97,000 fans behind him, but we're closing that gap pretty quickly. Week 16 saw influencer Sammy Vortex finally appearing in a singles match in a rivalry against Danielle Wallace that I planned to slowly develop until the end of the season. Now remember earlier in the video when I said I'd explain why I think I made a big mistake as I frantically tried to recover from pesky McFoley injuring two of my jobbers? 
It took me until week 16 to realise the lasting damage that this had done to me, starting all the way back in week 4. I'd signed so, so many jobbers to get through that injury week, and I had to continue releasing my drafted superstars until week 8. Rhea Ripley fortunately asked to leave early, which helped speed this up slightly. That I'd had an inflated roster size for so long, meaning lots of my jobbers were sitting out every week, losing popularity. I realised I needed to operate with a smaller roster going forward, and more people would need to be cut from NXT if I was going to build popularity enough to get a victory here. But was there going to be enough time left for me to win this challenge? I really didn't know. And what about Jerry? Was he going to become a three belt champion and unify the men's division with a victory in the WrestleMania main event? And let's not forget Trixie Gambit, who's still waiting for Penelope Perfect to return to get her shot at reclaiming the title. I got through week 16 with a good booking, and the same thing happened in week 17 where Jerry Hattrick retained his men's title in the main event once more, and the same again in week 18 where Penelope Perfect finally returned, with 74 popularity after her buff from appearing on the big screen to give Trixie Gambit the rematch she'd been waiting so long for, but Trixie lost again. I also continued my mission to play dirty this week by applying a power card to SmackDown that randomly reduced two of their rivalries by one level. I was closing in on both SmackDown and Raw, so I played a Veto Star on one and a Veto Random Superstar on the other as we went into Week 19, which would mean they'd both be missing a crucial member of their roster at the Week 20 Premium Live event. Week 19's show was fantastic for storylines. Trixie Gambit finally got a win over Penelope Perfect, but the title wasn't on the line. It increased their rivalry to level 4, and Trixie was a lock-in to get a title shot in next week's PLE. Kyle and Jerry teamed up for the first time in a while, and they took on the tag team title holders Broderick and Heath Manhattan, and Kyle and Jerry went over. Jerry became NXT's second two-belt holder and the first to do so in the male division. Social media influencer Sammy Vortex spearheaded the show with a five-star legendary TLC performance against Danielle Wallace. We headed into our final PLE before WrestleMania, 14,000 fans behind Mick Foley and Raw, and 47,000 fans behind Kurt Angle at SmackDown. And would you believe it? Mick Foley came for our heads again. He used a veto star card of his own, and now Penelope is banned from appearing at the show. Trixie Gambit, in a level 4 rivalry with Penelope, would miss out on her chance to fight for the title again. I had another sneaky plan though, going into this week's PLE. I'll reveal what that was in just a few moments. The card started with a 4 star Extreme Rules match between Jerry Hattrick and Broderick. We then had a 3 star tag team match between Tim Burr and Argus the Great against Matt Adore and Stacked McSlacks. This was followed by a 3.5 star mid card, a level 4 rivalry between Heath Manhattan and Captain Grog, and we then had a 2.5 star match between Trixie Gambit and Cora Cut. I didn't want Trixie to miss out on the PLE altogether, but she was clearly devastated not to be fighting for the title. And we finished with a huge submission match between Kyle Slickman and Chuck McWagon. Kyle won in a 5 star legendary match. Overall, despite getting an amazing booking rating for the show, this was quite a disappointing PLE for this late stage in the season. A 2.5 star, a 3 star, and a 3.5 star midcard, but I wasn't that concerned because of my sneaky plan. I'd used a special promotion card this week, my one and only special promotion card that I picked up in the entire season of this challenge, and anyone that played last year's edition of the game will know how overpowered these are. Well, it turns out they're nowhere near as overpowered anymore. They used to retain you an extra 5% of your fans if you used it late on in the season, but now, because seasons go on and on for a seemingly infinite amount of time, they only get you a 1% boost at the end of the first season, rather than 5%, taking the brand's weekly fan retention rate from 0.99 to 1.0. On top of that, Kurt Angle must have also used a special promotion card because his fan retention rate was also 1.0. I hadn't been concerned about the underperformance this week, but now I was. I'd need to go absolutely huge in the final five weeks of the season to try to get a win here. And let's not forget my stupid promise to Jerry Hattrick that he'd headline WrestleMania with three different belts around his waist, and Trixie Gambit still needs her shot at redemption too. In week 21, I decided to freshen things up a little bit. Penelope Perfect would go up against Ali Brawler in a title match, though Cora Cut would be interfering with Ali to make her chances of victory slim at best. Stacked McSlacks would take all of his muscles to carry Matador into a rivalry with Tim Burr and Argus the Great. Dante Roberts would face up against Triton in the second of our mid-card matches, and Eddie Pop would face Cash Suplex for the world title. The show was a success. The opener was rated 4.5 stars, and Penelope, now with 92 popularity, retained. 
The male tag team would deliver a healthy 3.5 rating, with their popularity ranging between 46 and 66. Dante against Triton would be a little bit of a disappointment with a 2 star rating, but the main event delivered a banger of a tables match with Cash Suplex becoming the world champion for the first time. This amazing booking put us in touching distance of the lead. We're now second in fans and just 11,000 behind SmackDown. Week 22 was nothing special. I continued building rivalries and gave Trixie Gambit the chance to get some revenge over Penelope Perfect in a tag team match for the title in the main event. And Trixie won! She finally got one over on Penelope, but she still wouldn't be satisfied unless she could reclaim her singles title too. In week 23, I put on a big card. It was time to start fighting for a win because we were rapidly running out of time. Cash Suplex attempted to retain his title against Eddie Pop in the opener, and it was a 4.5 star rated Extreme Rules match, but he did not retain, and Eddie Pop became world champion for the second time. Or maybe the third time, I can't really remember at this point. That all might change next week regardless. Ooh, mysterious. Stacked McSlacks and Matador won against Tim Burr and Argus the Great, and we were finally delivering decent tag team ratings, a 3.5 star in our first mid-card match. The team that everyone loves to hate and hates to love, Kyle Slickman and Jerry Hattrick faced off and defeated Heath Manhattan and Broderick in a heated second tag team of the card. I wanted to put on plenty of tag teams at this stage to fuel rivalries, keep singles rivalries from going stale, and to max out popularity on as many of my jobbers as I could. And Trixie Gambit and Ali Brawler rematched Penelope Perfect and Cora Cup for the tag team belt, but Penelope and Cora won again. It was an amazing booking. We gained 62,200 fans, we took the lead, we... Wait, we took the lead. We took the lead. With two weeks left in the season, we are officially ahead in both fans and trophies after going the entire season with a roster of jobbers. I had only three tasks remaining. One, hold on to our lead at all costs. Two, see if Jerry Hattrick could win the world championship belt to unify the men's division. And three, see if Jerry Hattrick could win in a WrestleMania main event. In week 24, things were about to get exciting. It started with Tim Burr and Argus the Great taking on Stacked McSlacks and Matt Ador in a 4.5 star rated Hell in a Cell. But that's not what the diehard fans came to see. In the second match, despite being an awful cruiser versus fighter matchup, Jerry would get a shot at the World Championship belt against the 95 popularity of Eddie Pop. Despite a 2.5 star match rating, Jerry Hattrick came out victorious. In potentially the greatest run in WWE history, Jerry Hattrick has gone an entire season undefeated and has gone from being the least popular jobber on the roster to holding the men's singles belt, the men's tag team belt, and now the world championship belt too. All he'd need to do now is bring home a victory at WrestleMania next week to cement his place in history. The show continued to be an amazing success from there on in with Kyle Slickman facing Broderick in a 3.5 star match, and Penelope Perfect finally putting her singles title on the line against Trixie Gambit again in an Extreme Rules main event match that was rated 4.5 stars. To break the hearts of Trixie fans all around the world, Penelope came out victorious, and this would give Trixie just one more chance to reclaim her title at WrestleMania. It all came down to this week. Week 25. WrestleMania. We'd managed to put ourselves in the lead, coming back from nearly 200,000 fans behind, and all we needed to do was put on an amazing booking to virtually guarantee victory. And it couldn't have started any worse. Guess who showed up? Mick Foley. He used a veto star card on us again. We'd be missing one of our finest local talent stars for the biggest show of the season. Would Jerry be the one to miss out? Could it be Kyle? No, it was neither of those. Yet again, it was our female singles and tag team champion, movie star Penelope Perfect, whose level 4 rivalry against Trixie Gambit would now go unsettled, and we'd be unable to put on a women's title match of any kind. We started WrestleMania with a level 4 rivalry Iron Man match between Eddie Pop and Cash Suplex. What would the score be? It was the perfect start. Five stars. Argus the Great and Tim Burr then faced Matador and Stacked McSlacks in a level 3 TLC match. At 4 stars, it would be the lowest rated match on our card. And at the start of the season, I never thought I'd be saying that a 4 star match would be the worst on our show. Ali Brawler and Cora Cut then faced each other in a level 3 submission match, which delivered another 5 star result. Triton then faced Dante Roberts in a level 3 false count anywhere for another perfect score. And finally, it all came down to the main event.
Was I really going to take a stupid and unnecessary risk in the challenge and potentially jeopardise a win, all to see if Jerry Hattrick could retain his tag team belt alongside Diamond Lobby legend Kyle Slickman? Well, I've basically already spoiled the rating. You should know by now that this would be another 5 star match. But was Jerry Hattrick going to go an entire season undefeated and write his name in WWE folklore and hold all three belts at the end of the season? Or were Broderick and Heath Manhattan about to spoil the party in this tornado tag match? I'll pass things over to commentator Ferg as we watch the highlights from WrestleMania's main event. You join us here live at WrestleMania, where we're potentially about to witness the pinnacle of the greatest careers in WWE history. Broderick and Manhattan have started strong as Heath hits a nasty DDT on the outside. Kyle answering back with a slick kick, but Heath's there to break it up. Now Heath's got him in a bear hug. This could be trouble for Kyle. Broderick going for a pin, but Kyle's there to break it up just in time. Now Kyle with some offense of his own as he hits a nice Russian leg sweep. And Jerry Hattrick with the chair. But Heath's back up and easily presses Jerry above his head. Ah, oh, come on, that's not necessary. Don't you know he's 67? And he just drops him onto the ground. Oh no, it looks like Broderick's going for the last ride. If he hits this, Jerry's entire legacy could be ruined. He's got him up and plants Slickman. This could be it. No WrestleMania win for Jerry. One, two, three, it's over. I can't believe it's over. The undefeated streak in tatters as Broderick and Manhattan raise the titles. Why? Just why? And now you know the devastating result. In the last week of the season, Jerry picked up the first loss on his scorecard at the most crucial time. But in true Jerry Hattrick fashion, he put on a five-star performance whilst doing so. I was delighted with our show, but did it perform well enough to carry us to victory in the Jobbers Only Challenge? After all, it wasn't perfect. Our biggest female rivalry was missing. No women's belts were on the line whatsoever. All right, all right, enough tension building. We did it. We ended the season an incredible 102,000 fans ahead of SmackDown, 142,000 ahead of our stinky rival Mick Foley, and I don't even know if Xavier Woods was playing. We were 422,000 fans ahead of NXT 2.0. I looked at our results and at our win and our clean sweep in the end of season GM awards, but I was then hit with some candid realizations as NXT's individual awards were dished out. Kyle Slickman was booked in the most matches, and even though he lost most of those matches, he still kept showing up. Danielle Wallace, someone I'd barely given a second thought to throughout the save, delivered the highest average match rating. Talk about being an underrated and underappreciated part of the team. Jerry Hattrick gained the most popularity with 99 gained in total, and he won the most matches, but he couldn't win the one that mattered the most. And to top it all off, Jackson Smooth spent the most weeks injured. He made a sacrifice for us all that resulted in a victory. It turned out that this challenge wasn't about winning, but the friends we made along the way.